Hey everyone, welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. We're doing a series of special interviews this week from Porkfest in New Hampshire. This is a project of the Free State Project and it's a gathering of libertarians and constitutional conservatives, Republicans. Uh, we even had some uh, converted progressives here who are looking for liberty and we're hanging out in this beautiful place and these conversations are gonna be awesome. Check it out. We'll be okay. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. <clears throat> Gene, how's it going? Uh, going great, uh, in a great mood. Uh, got to uh, Pork Fest Tuesday evening, uh, and uh, uh, just I feel among so many friends, so many people who appreciate what I do, but also so many people who have so much to say and so much to teach me, you included. So this, is this your first pork fest? It is, uh, to my great embarrassment, my first pork fest. <laughs> and uh, I've obviously missed out on a lot. I'm 76 and still getting my kicks at 76. Uh, but uh, life is improving even more now that I've made my fir first pork fest and uh, recognized uh, that uh, there's so much life and so much vitality and so much intellect among uh, libertarians, even more than I thought uh, ever existed before. So I want to talk about the Soho Forum, yeah. but uh, before yeah. we do that, uh, we'll just talk about what you're doing here because yeah. you are the guy that hosts debates yeah. amongst libertarians and classical liberals, um, but but other sides as well, right? Yeah, all the sides that we can get, you yeah. know, absolutely. If it's a debatable issue uh, at all, uh, and uh, you know, I, I I'm I love what I do. I get a chance to run it just according to what I like. Uh, I've got some two loyal people, three loyal people, my wife included, who caters our parties. Uh, and indeed, the Soul Forum, I should em emphasize, however, has had a twofold mission, uh, not just to hold debates of interest to libertarians, which sort of means of interest to me, and hopefully my interests reflect most other people's, not always, but uh, that's just the way it goes. However, we have a we have sold out every event now for the last couple of years, in in a hall of more than two hundred people, uh, and. Uh, but also, I think part of the attraction is that the second fold mission is to make it a group experience, have a party afterwards. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know, there are some of us, amazingly enough, who when we walk, see people at a bar talking convivially, we get an anxiety attack. Will we fit in? Will they accept us? Uh, what are we going to say? Well, at the Soul Forum, you can always discuss the debate. Yeah. Something to talk about, an icebreaker, yeah. and uh, a way to get to know uh, other people, other libertarians. And of course, there are people who mix with us who are not libertarian. Uh, we, uh, we then had to go on Zoom for our debates for most of last year. Uh, uh, and uh, that was a bit of a downer, but at least we had some decent, worthy debates uh, on Zoom. And uh, all of our debates, I should emphasize, but for, for podcast listeners especially, are available at the Soul Forum Debates podcast. That's the, the Soul Forum Debates podcast. Uh, we started in the fall of uh, 2016, and so we have over 50 debates uh, of interest to libertarians. The topics are pretty uh, obvious as you scan down the list if you go into that podcast. I've done, I guess, seven debates, and so much of my embarrassment. Three of them were with, were with socialists, mm -hmm. and um, I publicly declared that uh, I will not have another debate with a socialist. The trilogy was enough, unless unless I get some sort of raucous challenge from a socialist to debate that person. I guess I shouldn't refuse a challenge, but probably after my three, I'm not going to get any challenges, so I can be comfortable that my debating uh, career with socialists is over. So, uh, so why, why is it unfun to debate socialists? Why is it unfun? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, yeah, well, you know, it's not, it's not look, yeah, it's not totally unfun. Uh, although I should add, by the way, uh, let me generalize about all debates. Uh, Tom Woods, you're going to hear him tomorrow say uh, that when you are a public speaker, everybody in the audience is pulling for you. Recognize that. They want you to do well. Even if you screw up a little bit, they want you to do well, and they regard that as a joke. And I always tell Tom, a big fat asterisk has to be fit there unless you're doing a debate at the Soul Forum. And indeed, I should even put a fine point on that about doing a debate at the Soul Forum because I believe in one-on-one -on -one debates. Uh, uh, 
Uh, that defines the cell form format. One person against one person. Uh, I do feel that the, the committee style, where it's two against two, uh, often doesn't work. Uh, each person doesn't get enough time to talk. Uh, I mean, they, they often, unlike college debating, which might have its own problems, uh, they often haven't even co conversed, they haven't even planned the, and co coordinated what they're going to say. Uh, and so I think it doesn't work out. If, if you, you are responsible for your argument, you're the only one defending your argument. You can't lean back on the politician they teamed you up with, whoever he is, to, to help carry the ball. And now, of course, that takes a risk because clearly if, if the two people I get are not especially great, you know, they want to mix it up with, with, with a duo just to sort of hedge their bets. So I take more of a risk when I do it that way. But, uh, but that keys in to why it's a stressful occasion because it's just you against somebody else. So not everybody in the audience is pulling for you when you do a so forum debate because uh, half the audience may have their knives out for you, um, although not necessarily the one that we just did uh, on, uh, on strategy for the Libertarian Party versus the Free State. That debate was done very spiritedly but with love. However, in other cases, especially when I did, did, did debates uh, with socialists, and especially when I did those debates in New York City, I, the first two were done in New York City, the, the third was sponsored by uh, the young gentleman back there named Sam who, uh, who moderated the debate and we held that in Florida. So there were fewer people who were socialists in that particular audience. However, when the Q&A starts, uh, uh, the intensity of the questions and the hatred that they extend toward me when I do a debate with a socialist is palpable uh, because they some, I really get under their skin. Well, especially under their skin with my argument, which is because my key argument with all three has been that the best aspects of socialism are readily achievable under free market capitalism. And that I insist that the mistake is to define capitalism in the Marxist sense that it's workers and, and, uh, and employers, workers and capitalists. That's one manifestation of capitalism. It seems to be the most popular. However, there are worker co-ops. There always have been. They're, they're very, the corporation dominates, but to, who knows whether that will last. Uh, we, the cap Capitalism is simply private property rights and the means of production uh, certified by law, and that's it. And then how you structure it is up for grabs. You want to create a, 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 a kibbutz-like environment where everybody gets a vote and everybody does it democratically, that's up to you. I dare say, I spoke to a couple of your young people who were escorting me over here uh, uh, for this interview, and they talked about, one of the, the young lady talked about working for you guys for 10 years and calling it a family. Who knows how we characterize your particular enterprise? Yeah. You know, is yeah. it, you know, who knows how much, you know, uh, uh, how much this? Uh, it, it, the odd part is, if you remember, Gary Becker won an, won an award for saying that a family is like a firm, and and I once quipped that you could probably argue that many firms are like a family. Right. So therefore, let a hundred flowers bloom, which is actually the the accurate uh, statement originally from Mao Zedong. He said only a hundred flowers. Hundred flowers are plenty to bloom, and that's capitalism. So, so, so you're a Maoist, really? I'm a Maoist saying. in that yeah. sense, yeah. a capitalist Maoist. So the point is that I get under their skin because, again, I emphasize that if there's all that anger out there about being wage and salary employees, then it's going to change. It should have changed overnight. All that success with Mondragon in Spain uh, that that you supposedly tout with worker ownership, then why why don't we have Mondragons of similar size in the U.S. yet? Uh, uh, maybe maybe some of us would rather be wage and salary employees. Yeah. You know? And so, anyway, you, you forced me to digress under that. You were asking me about, about debating generally, about speaking generally. Now I'm even forgetting your question. And well, I, I, want to, I, want to, I want to go back to socialism. Yeah, this, okay, this sure. Is, yeah. This is an interesting subject yeah, because yeah, I, yeah. I'm one of those guys that, that hesitate yeah. to use the C word, capitalism. I feel, oh, yeah. I feel yeah. like it, um, whatever it originally meant, yeah. and, and, and I, never, I never thought the market process was fundamentally about capital accumulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, particularly young people today, when they hear the word capitalism, yeah. what they really hear is cronyism because yeah. they grew up watching Wall Street get bailed out by politicians of Washington, D.C. I call that crapitalism, but crapitalism. go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. I, I'll use that. <laughs> okay. It's, um, but I, I'm thinking, as I do, I, I, I love to think about debt economists, and, and yeah, Ludwig von yeah, Mises yeah, yeah. described the market as a process. Yeah. And I've taken that and I've bastardized it, and, and if it's just this 
process of people just trying to figure stuff out. Yeah. And part of the way they do that is through competition. Part of the way they do that is through cooperation. Yeah. It's it's iterations of mistakes and successes, just trying to make your way it, it's, through it's this, trial this and error, unknowable sure, yeah. future yeah. world. Yeah, yeah. And to me, like there's there's got to be a way to explain capitalism without calling it capitalism, so that people that think they're socialists but they're not socialists. They're yeah. they're they're about bottom up. They're about community. They're about mm-hmm. people figuring stuff out. Mm-hmm. Um, that's mm-hmm. that's what freedom allows you to do. Mm-hmm. A central plan never gets you there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, no. I I basically agree with you, and I, I find I, I look. I love I love semantics. I love linguistics, and thinking about words and what they mean, and uh, and how they change their meaning over time, uh, certainly fascinates me. I, I, of course, we have the term free market. I'm only I'm only concerned having debated the issue and having seen so many uh, young people out there with their knives out for me. Uh, with respect to the arguments I make, uh, if I say free market, they're going to laugh. If I you know, but indeed I I, I guess. I I've settled on the idea of accepting the word capitalism, although I, I grant your point that you don't necessarily have to accept it, and I think that's part of your style and part of who you are. I'm, I define myself basically as an economist who knows numbers and who can cite numbers like, you know, the lower 90% accounts for nearly 80% of all consumer spending, and and that the lower 90% is presumably your proletariat, right? The other 10% and are, are, the, are the capitalists, more or less, and, but, but they control the consumer dollar, and they can use the consumer dollar to favor worker-owned firms. So I start with that. But getting back to the point, so I settle on capitalism uh, for my crony capitalism and then use the word capitalism, partly because I suppose when I define capitalism, which I get, or the free market, where you, I think, would it be, or unless you want to modify my definition, which is that we do have to say that it is prop, it is property rights in the means of production enforced by law be it an ancap kind of kind of society or a, or a, or a minicus kind of society but there is law legal rights in that property in the means of production and means of production despite all the intangible capital out there which i think is a fascinating subject in itself uh, the the capital that you can't touch which is extremely valuable and of course your you know kibbe inc is intangible capital you know of course you've got that you know you've got this tent and you've got that you I mean know, it, it's it's huge it's it's, it's a big <laughs> it's a big enterprise big enterprise you've got that that trailer that t- so you have you have property rights in that means of production yeah. that helps produce the ki- the, the, the the kibbutznik the kibbe output put <laughs> and uh, which and uh, so on but and you have those properties my point is that i have to say assertively that it is that i'm not going to be squishy and not define what i mean i'm just as i say it just means that uh, that then let a hundred flowers bloom so that's why I'm sort of stuck with it, but I know. Look, you, you I, I, I could talk about what you were saying the other day. Uh, enjoyed your talk uh, when you were talking about selfishness versus being unselfish. And of course, I had a debate with Yaron Brook about selfishness. By the way, Yaron Brook is Iranian, and I have to say privately, I'm happy to to have noticed that the last time I encountered Yaron, I had him debate John Mackey. He was using the word self-interest, yeah. not selfishness. Yeah. And and so and indeed, obviously, self-interest. Was which is a term that uh, that was used by obviously Adam Smith most famously, uh, and gets back to an old Jewish saying: "If I am not for myself, who will be for me?" You know, all of that is healthy. But I wanted I wanted Yaron to understand that, just as you said, by the way, and as I put it when I debated Yaron, that if I had spent my first twenty two years under the yoke of Bolshevism, where they keep telling me it's you're selfish unless you serve the state. And I should add, I met some young people in Romania and Bucharest who loved Ayn Rand and who loved her selfishness as a virtue thing, because they too were told you're selfish unless you serve the state. I would shout to the root to rooftops that selfishness is a virtue. Yeah. But but I think it's a little bit outmoded. I think you have to make your peace with the fact that, that the word has not budged. Yeah. I, I went back to Samuel Johnson's dictionary yeah. up to the press. And by the, Adam Smith even used the word selfish as a pejorative. How selfish soever man is, there's a certain compassion in him. In him. So therefore, uh, you, you, although I respected everything you said the other day, because you basically made my point yeah. about where Ayn Rand came from, and of course the, the awesome achievement uh, of th- that she should be credited with uh, about how she overcame it, came to this country, 
and contributed so much to our thinking. Uh, but I think uh, that that's that's antiquated. But getting back then to the word capitalism, I'm sort of stuck with it for that reason, partly because I, on the debater circuit, I'm so used to the antagonism that I get whenever I start saying free market or something else. Uh, I'm able then to point out a hundred flowers can bloom once I define it and once I go on to elaborate about it. So yeah. I used to do the Bill Maher show all the time. Oh my gosh! And my wife would sit in the audience. Yeah. And it wasn't half and half. That yeah. the visceral hatred for every word I said yeah, was, wow. was I something even, else. I didn't even but that's know that. like um, that's almost fun because you sort of you sort of feed off of that and yeah. and I always think about it like when I debate somebody yeah. and let's say somebody from the other side and maybe it's someone from the right or someone you know, radical progressive or something like mm -hmm. that, I always figure that, that my job's not to convince them of anything. Oh, yeah. It's to get any potential audience to, mm. to, to sort of rethink and question their own conclusions. Yeah. And, and that falls into the language thing because, you know, so many words are so tribal now. And you say the word capitalism and some people's heads, uh, minds just shut down. They're like, okay, I know who he is. Um, so I always like whatever word I use, I then go ahead and define it um, in the context of what I think are, are hopefully more universal value, values so that um, people understand what you meant by that word because language language is this spontaneously evolving thing particularly with social media like yeah. I, I can't keep up with the new words that the kids are using today <laughs> me neither yeah um, wow. but I, I like uh, like for instance and and here at Porkfest and and with the Mises caucus guys they they hate the word democracy and I think that's a big mistake. Oh wow! Um, okay, then let's. We're about to have a soul forum-like debate okay. about the word. But okay, well, well, I'm sorry. You probably have a good point to make about why you shouldn't hate the word democracy. What's, yeah. So, what's, like, there's a, there's a vulgar meaning of democracy yeah. that means fifty plus one person yeah. gets to do whatever they want to the other forty nine percent. Yeah. That's Piss not, in the soup with the other forty nine yeah. percent, as we like to say. That's that's not democracy in my mind. I yeah. think I think a market yeah. is is yeah. radically democratic because yeah. everybody's voting all the time. Everybody's choosing yeah. what they want, mm. but um, th mm. there there's no losers in the same sense that there is when we use so called democracy to make political decisions. So I and and whether we like it or not, uh, you know, uh, big D democracy is now almost this term of religious endurance and. And I say we don't give up these words. Like we, you know, community is the same thing. My title at Free the People is Chief Community Organizer. Oh yes. And and it, that triggers some people. And and I'm like, are you against being organized or <laughs> the community? And so like, I don't want to give up these really cool words that are rich with meaning beyond sort of the vulgar caricature of of democracy as is, is this god that gets empowers the majority to persecute the minority. Yeah. Are you buying this? Yeah, no, no, indeed. No, 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 absolutely. I mean, of course, I completely agree with you uh, about about the term community, which is always a very important concept for me, having been raised by, by a communist mom. Uh, uh, and uh, I, of course, insist that, you know, all communities have to be voluntary and that and that I would even, I would, by the way, even like to see more worker co-ops because I think more people will learn about the headaches and problems of running an enterprise. Uh, I'd like to see more of that voluntary socialism happening. Uh, getting back to your point about democracy, I do like your point, and I think that's that, that that's your particular niche uh, to, to the extent that you have claims to being brilliant and it's something to contribute, uh, that, you know, seeing things differently and seeing different things, uh, which is, I think, part of your value of, of what you contribute to, uh, to uh, what we all have to learn as libertarians. Indeed, uh, that's part of my hobby horse as well, uh, although I didn't put it your way, which is, again, that, uh, that again, 80% of the, con nearly 80% of the consumer spending comes from the lower 90%. Uh, Thomas Sowell, actually, uh, was the only economist I ever know who wrote about this briefly in Knowledge and Decisions when he talked about the allocation uh, under capitalism, the division of knowledge, which is what that great book is about under, uh, under, under market conditions. And he said, you know, some people dismiss the idea because rich people, after all, have more votes 
to cast than poor people. But but as he said, as a practical matter, uh, the since since we ninety percent poor people greatly outnumber the rich, even in this society of, of income inequality of crony capitalism, uh, to some I mean I I would say at the end of the day probably in a free market probably the lower ninety percent would have more than eighty percent of the votes. By and large, we all know the great fortunes ninety nine percent of the great fortunes are made by selling to the masses. That's Sam Walton. That's Jeff Bezos. That's Steve Jobs. If you can't get the masses to buy it, you're not going to you're not going to become a billionaire most of the time. Uh, and so that as a practical matter, it's really that the top ten percent is investing their money to please the lower ninety percent as a first approximation with very few differences. So therefore, uh, and then that's the part of it that copes with the idea of the inequality of the number of votes you can cast. So it isn't one man, one vote. But then, of course, you get to the key advantage that you point out, which is that there are no losers, that that your minority vote can still get, you know, so far, Matt Kibbe has not sold his product to 51% of the population. But somehow or other, he's still getting enough votes in his favor so that he can continue to sell his product. That key overwhelming advantage, which is our different kind of, of uh, m- minority democracy, is the key killer point. And so, again, I can only contribute the point that that if you really want to con- want to con- uh, go toe to toe with a one person one vote uh, d- Democrats, you actually do pretty well anyway. Insofar as that con that conflict is concerned, and then at the end of the day, you do far better because it isn't uh, it isn't winner take all. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the markets are all about defending the rights of the minority. Yes, all about defending the rights of the minority. And again, people of limited means have enormous influence over the market outcomes. Yeah. So you mentioned Thomas Sowell, and, yeah. and, yeah. and I'm, I'm thinking specifically about the book Knowledge and Decisions, yeah. which was basically translating Hayek into more understandable stories and Take, plain English. Taking a, taking a few pages of Hayek and turning it into a 400-page book where, where, again, since I think Thomas Sowell is a genius, and since I think he's a giant, I always like to like to criticize the genius and giant, even though toward the end of the book, he's suddenly talking about foreign policy uh, uh, for an extended uh, uh, number of pages, which has nothing to do with the book itself. Yeah. However, the first 350 pages of that book, I think, is brilliant, and I've always been surprised when people consider it to be a little bit dense. Uh, I, I, I regard it as extremely readable. He, he has a, an incredible amount imagination and, and, and energetic energy at research. So he, he comes up with so many examples to, to, to apply uh, to, uh, the, the Hayekian concept to, which is how we divide, how we, how we communicate knowledge under market conditions. But I think you were going to talk about it. I interrupted you. What were you going to say? I don't even know. But uh, <laughs> if, when, I, when people ask me, yeah. so we talk about Hayek a lot oh, on, yes, on yeah, the yeah, show because yeah, I'm, yeah. A, I'm a huge yeah. Yes. Hayek, Hayek fanatic. Yeah. Um, but when people ask me, like, oh, the, Hayek has written so much and it's so dense, what should I start with? I always mm-hmm. say, go read Knowledge and Decisions by Thomas Sowell. No, that's a great idea. Absolutely. And, you know, you know, it's funny. I mean, maybe you know the story that that uh, Reason Magazine, I think it was probably Nick Gillespie at Reason Magazine when he was editor, or maybe his predecessor, got Hayek to review the book. And uh, did you, did you no, know, I don't there? know the story. Well, no, it's just funny that you should read Hayek's review. Hayek, Hayek actually, you know, was very pleased by the book, and he said, "I, I, I, I put off, I delayed reading the book because I was busy with, with my own project. But now, having read the book, I realized I should have read this book before I got on to my next project because it taught me so much." And and then and then he goes on to say, and I especially appreciate it. And then he says, and then he then he elaborates. Uh, I especially appreciated what what occurs on page ninety eight, page seventy two. <laughs> he gives a, a page listing, and I and and I said I guess they were so into and that's it. And I, they they were so I I I was an edit I was a book review editor and uh, and when I was at Barnes and I said I would have asked the great man to put, would you please elaborate on those sec- on those sec- what did you like about page this page that but again at least if you have a copy of the book and you see you see what Hayek is referencing what page number then you can see what did Hayek especially like about that about knowledge and decisions although it would have been great if Hayek had been pushed to elaborate on what he meant but I guess again they were so in awe of getting this guy to to do the review, they didn't want to push him at all. Uh, but anyway, indeed, that's a book, uh, a, a book to read. And uh, I, although I look, I, now, now I have to ask you, 
uh, why don't you mention Murray Rothbard ever? Um, so th there's a reason for that. Yeah. I, so, so like when I went to yeah. school at George Mason, yeah. um, we used to go, we had a chance to go see Murray Rothbard all the time. And, and I um, famously, I've told this story, I had my first real beer with Murray Rothbard. Well, that should be in, reason. <laughs> in Palo Alto. Yeah. Um, but the reason I don't is because I think, uh, I mean, I started off reading Ayn Rand when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. That, oh. was, that was my gateway as, yeah, yeah, as yeah, a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so I had that sort of uh, hardcore rage against the machine individualism yeah. thing. I, I had that part down. Yeah. I, I, could be, I could be an angry libertarian. Murray, Murray Rothbard loved that book. You yeah. Know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Murray, like I always put Murray in that camp. Yeah. And and later, when when I went to Mason, um, a, a dear mentor of mine, Don Lavoy, yes, turned me on to Hayek and that whole continental philosophy tradition. Oh yeah, and and it, it I struggled for a while to sort of square it with sort of the Randy and objectivist thing, and I ended up I ended up abandoning some of that project to to better understand Hayek. So it's a matter of emphasis because I think libertarians generally. Um, are not good about s explaining the power of community, mm. and that's like Hayek is to me is almost a communitarian. I think he would he would be upset with that definition, but he was explaining the power of what happens when people are free to come together, yes. and and create like Don Lavoy called it, um, and this will sound sort of socialist. He called the market process uh, uh, the. The, the way that we can create a greater social intelligence. Yeah. And and I think Ayn Rand would freak out if she heard the phrase greater social intelligence. <laughs> and so like just my my fascination. I don't oh, talk I about oh. Murray that much oh. because oh. because a lot of his work yeah. um I, I'm I'm mm -hmm. not treating him fairly here, but it, I sort of put him in the Rand camp. Like he's the individualist. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, I actually no. That's that's a fair comment. That, that's a matter of taste. Uh, as a matter of fact, though, uh, uh, if if I were asked, I would indeed probably echo your point and say, uh, read read the, the read the greatest popularization ever written of a great essay, Knowledge and Decisions. Uh, if you want to get a taste of what Hayek. Uh, ended up admiring and thinking this guy has really taken my views to a new level. Uh, the, the, not just not, not just the division of labor, but the division of knowledge, and contributed something unique to it. Uh, from Hayek's rather compressed essay on the subject, Hayek, of course, writing English uh, as a second language and pretty competently, but not quite with the with the panache of, of Thomas Sowell. However, uh, if then pressed, what should I read by Hayek? You know what I would say: the Mirage. Of social justice, because that uh, that is a that's not, that's a somewhat unpleasant tonic. That book, uh, that's the second in the series on liberty. I mean, it's, uh, he did a trilogy on liberty. I forget the full title, but this one was basically called the Mirage of Social Justice. And uh, and the only way and, and, ba and where he does basically say that that just as we 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 should we gave up long ago looking for the just price we 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 we, we, we it's just as foolish to look for the just wage and and so you might say it's a kind of a cynical view of the world uh, but although I don't regard it as such but certainly a lot of uh, I think a lot of young people uh, have got to uh, I think it would be good if they understood that uh, I'm, I'm actually going to mention I'm going to do a, a talk uh, tomorrow uh, about wages and salaries tomorrow at the anthem, just to advertise that, but I'm going to talk about that. Uh, I should say that the only part of it where Hayek uh, Hayek then goes over a series of examples and basically says how impossible it really is for for us to claim that all wages and salaries are are, are are justly allocated. The example I used when I, I used to lecture on Thomas Piketty's crazy book, you know, well, uh, uh, capitalism in the 21st century, and uh, and and. And he, of course, assumes that we're all defending capitalism on the basis of some concept of merit, that everybody gets their just desserts under capitalism, under free market, as, as we may call it. Uh, but, of course, uh, we don't assume that. And, of course, the first statement I made is Thomas, Thomas Piketty has probably made millions of euros from the international sale of his book. I think his book is without merit. It is worthless. But am, am I going to begrudge him all that money? Uh, uh, you, you know, the other joke about that book is that somebody pointed out that in the Kindle edition, uh, the, uh, the records that were kept showed that nobody marked it. The, the, all the markings did not go past page 22. So 
so the guy said, "This this gets the gets the award of the best selling book that was most unread because it is dead." I had to I I plowed through every damn page of it. Sorry about that. Well, I had to because yeah. I wanted to review it. And and by the way, I found at the end of the day that you know he doesn't even apply the, the his notion. The notion is that. Capitalists accuse, uh, accumulate wealth like a Malthusian idea that wealth is accumulated at a geometric rate, and uh, and that's why the capitalists get so rich, and that's that's capitalism's problem. So we have to punitively tax wealth. But did you know that 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 when he gets to the U.S., he literally says that he can't apply his model to the U.S. the Bet Noir. He can. He then invades against CEO salaries. That's what he talks about. That the CEOs get paid too much. Uh, it, it reduces to that. So it's the, it's basically all, uh, old wine in that new bottle. And again, I digressed on that. But getting back to Hayek, the point is that when I met, when I used to lecture about that and point that out, I know there was a certain objection. Uh, and and and. And there is something to it. Certainly, in a particular work environment, where you look, I, I wrote, I, I was a journalist at Barron's, so I had a certain standard about. I, I mean, I didn't care. Look, I recognized I was economic economics columnist, and Barron's is written for people who want to read about the stock market every day. People who want to follow the stock market the way you follow a sport. And I, I wasn't even that kind of person. So I had the privilege of writing about the economy, uh, and they never rotated me. They just kept me in. My particular niche where I was happy. I earned considerably less than a number of the stars who could really about write about the stock market with pizzazz, but I thought, well, they merit that. They're contributing. So therefore, I did have, you do often have a sense of merit in your narrow work environment if you believe in the purposes of the organization. There is a certain feeling that this person contributes more, and you'd like to see a certain fairness Yes, on the on the on the individ, on the firm level, on on the most on on the level of those people who are more closely around you in the market economy. However, Hayek is still totally right that if you're going to broaden that to the larger economy, then then you're going to really run into trouble. You know, because there's so many things, that, so many people who make fortunes of money, and I see no merit in what they do. So what am I? So what am I going to do? Begrudge them the, the capitalist act between consenting adults to echo Robin Nozick. So that that was Hayek's. I think that was an important contribution of Hayek, and it was very tough-minded, a very readable book. And I, I don't know if you have the same opinion. Of yeah, that book. Yeah, 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 very much so. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. I just remembered by. Yeah. By the way, yeah. that uh, yeah. this morning when I was talking to Dave Smith, yeah. I quoted Murray Rothbard in *Man, Economy, and State*. So there it you does are. Happen. So it what does did happen? You, I, I hope you remembered it right, because I had that book. What did you quote? I don't remember. <laughs> don't remember. <laughs> don't remember what you quoted. Was anyone this here? What did I say? I don't <laughs> what? Know. Well, we'll go back to Nobody the tape remembers. later. It's okay. I like, you know, getting back just to, to do something about a uh, little, little uh, advertising for a moment. When you and Tom were talking yesterday about keeping things simple, mm -hmm. and as you know, as I told you earlier, I love Tom Woods. The only reason why I support Dave Smith for president is that is because Tom Woods refuses to run. And I think Tom would probably appeal to a broader, a broader constituency. I understand why Dave is so popular, uh, but. Uh, Tom would be my man, so I love and admire the guy. But but I insist, of course, on criticizing him where he's vulnerable. And I wish. And in his interview with you yesterday, he made the same remark about low IQ people or yeah. ten points of IQ. And I wish he'd get off that uh, particular uh, bit. And uh, but because you point, you guys were then pointing out about simplicity: don't hurt people and don't don't uh, don't take their stuff. Got that memorized. And uh, the point is, that's you know that's for, that's yeah, I, I would prefer that you say. I'm writing. That's for the 65 IQ people. I don't know that the 120 IQ people are going to understand it. But my story, as I told you earlier, was that my wife was her property rights were being uh, uh, being violated by somebody to, to, to summarize the story in shorthand. And we had a guy who was definitely low IQ. He'd worked at a bouncer at a nightclub. We weren't he wasn't committing violence against anybody on our behalf. But he was doing something. And he kept saying. It's your you. It's your property, and they won't get off your property. This restaurant that refused to leave. I mean, this guy had an eighty. This this guy understood something about property rights that the hundred thirty IQ people might not understand at all. So I wish Tom would get off that particular. Especially when we're talking about the simplicity of libertarianism. You know, part of our advantage is that the sixty five seventy IQ people can readily understand us, and some of the hundred twenty IQ people get convoluted and can't quite grasp it. So getting back to Murray. For example, Murray 
in his speeches, uh, lots of recordings exist of his speeches. I liked, for example, the way he introduced the incentive problem under socialism. That is, that it reduces to who'll, who'll take out the garbage. You know, who'll, who'll do the dirty, who'll take out the garbage. He said, but they do have an answer for, for that. And then he, then he gave it his, his, his gleeful cackle, which I always love to hear. He said, oh, it's, it's socialist garbage. So, of course, they'll take out the socialist garbage. So that, that was Murray. He, he was able, uh, part of his genius was... He was able to simplify, and I dare say, come to think of it, yeah. that he had, of course, he was a guy, a, a Jewish guy from Brooklyn, and Hayek, of course, had been raised in a totally different tradition. So Hayek, Hayek's genius probably was not so much that he was able to simplify, even though, <clears throat> if you read The Mirage of Social Justice, I think you'll find it's pretty simple, because he, he laces it with a whole lot of examples about all the problems we have in saying this person deserves merit. And again, as he, as he puts it so succinctly, if you don't believe in the, the medieval concept of the just price, how can you believe in the medieval concept of the just wage? It's, it's, it's unplanned, and of course gets back to the Hayekian notion that, that, the, that, the, that the outcomes are just unplanned and, and they just re, re, result from, from, from just the way in which people will operate freely in a free market and, and, and how, how the allocations happen will not necessarily lead to the just wage or the just price that you think uh, should prevail. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I very much agree with you yeah. on the IQ thing. And yeah. I think, um, you know, it's a, it's a rhetorical device that yeah. he's using. Yeah. But, uh, you know, depending on who I'm talking to, when they ask me where I came up with don't hurt people and don't take yeah. their stuff, yeah. um, one version of that story is I wanted to tweet the entire 750 pages of, of Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments <laughs> in, in one sentence. Yeah. Um, that's sort of true. But it's also true that I stole it from your mom. And mom's common sense oh, yeah. is what did she teach yeah, yeah, you, yeah, right? Yeah. What did your mom teach you? Mm-hmm. Don't mm-hmm. hurt people, don't take their stuff. Yeah. And and that to me is 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 a profound wisdom. Uh, but you know, some people that think they're super smart, they start to think that they're smarter than that common wisdom. Mm-hmm. And some of the most odious central planners I know, super high IQ people, they they, they think they're smart enough to redesign the economy and, and replace that greater social intelligence that we were talking about with with a plan. So I'm I'm not sure that that IQ in any way tells you how smart people are in that sense. Like you know, I'm not talking about your ability to do math, but your your understanding of how the world works. You know, even I, I would even dare say that Charles Murray, who's written a lot about IQ, the bell curve, and so on, that uh, he he's re- he's recently published yet another book in which he mentions IQ a lot, and which he readily where he readily concedes that that so many other human attributes like compassion and empathy are uh, are, are are beyond uh, are, are not necessarily correlated with high or low IQ, and in a way, compassion and empathy is probably all you need to understand. Uh, Matt's insight. I, w- I would say one thing. The one thing I, oh, I just the other day when uh, Dennis Pratt was lecturing, I, I interjected something else about property where I guess the people of subtle mind start challenging you or you start getting challenges from the socialists in the audience who are ever present in my mind and I guess Bill Moore is ever present in yours. I'm curious to ask you about that uh, part of your experience. But, uh, but it, it, it's that... Uh, it's something a point that George Reisman, who's an economist, made uh, that uh, that that we all have to agree that 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 historically at any one point uh, a lot of property was unjustly appropriated. A lot of land was given. You know, the kings, the princes, they 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 love to give out land. Uh, a lot a lot of uh, legitimate property rights were seized from others. There's a whole welter of, of of unjust actions that you can't possibly unwind or redress. So then somebody might say, well, then how can you talk about legitimate property rights? Reisman's viewpoint, which I think is persuasive, is that the stain is wiped away if you let uh, free market capitalism to operate for a generation or so. The stain is wiped away because my wife owns a building, small building, on Bleecker Street, five Bleecker. We don't know who did she acquire it from. I mean, we, probably, it probably was justly built and whoever, but we don't know. But she she operates it. She's she's mixed her labor with it. She's uh, she, she has earned the right over time to manage it. In a free market, it falls into the most competent hands, the people who can responsibly manage it, so that therefore we get a 
replication of that idea of mixing your labor with the soil, of mixing your labor with capital. And that, I think that's that's a key point to understand about free market capital. Again, because we have to cope with the idea that we inherit a history that wasn't clean capitalism, that was clearly filled with corruption. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. let me uh, and let's yeah. let's start to wrap this up. Okay. But I, sure. I still haven't had a chance, yeah. and I don't know. Yeah. Uh, what was your how did you discover liberty? What was your what was your gateway drug? Man, economy, and state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I ha- I I, I was uh, privileged that uh, Jeff Tucker actually years ago asked me to do an introduction to a collection of. Uh, of articles by uh, essays by Murray Rothbard called Controversial Essays, 52 Essays. And I began the essay by writing, it was nearly 40 years ago that Murray Rothbard changed my life. At this point, it's nearly 50 years ago. And of course, that, as I jokingly said to once when I was, Tom Woods gave me a Gene Epstein week, and Tom Woods said, this, this is the most irrelevant story to all of you. Um, who could possibly come to libertarianism by reading Man, Economy, and State? I said, yeah, but it's my story. I, I was... I was I was uh, studying economics at the New School. I was teaching economics, and so I, uh, I I was ready to drop out. I was getting soured. Left wing economics wasn't offering me very much, which is what the New School was serving up, and uh, and mainstream economics, which I was pretty much forced to teach in uh, in uh, uh, undergraduate school. I had you know a teaching job. Uh, was also souring me, and uh, I just wanted to quit the whole business. I I picked up Man, Economy, and State just a couple of times in the New School Library, and then finally read it, and uh, wanted and uh, so that was my gateway because uh, it it taught me uh, uh, something, of course, that, which echoes your viewpoint that really Austrian economists, or Austrian economics, is sort of redundancy. That that by the way, when the mainstream, when Mil- Milton Friedman, who was basically mostly a main mainstream economists, uh, but it had many insights, or any of them who are mainstream, when they actually just roll up their sleeves and give up the bullshit of mathematics, momentarily forget that they all are whoring after jobs running the Federal Reserve or being chairman of the Federal Reserve, momentarily forget inventing that, which both of, both of which completely taints their discipline, that they want to regard it as a, a branch of physics to make it obscure, and they basically want to think top down in order to serve the rich and powerful in order to serve the interests of the state. Once they forget that, which many of them do, they sound like Austrians. Uh, if you read so many of Milton Friedman's better essays, he's sounding like an Austrian. He's basically using simple logic for the way people reason, act in markets, and mark the markets as a process. Uh, and so that's what I discovered by reading Man, Economy, and State. And also, the, what was a special gift to me, which I could go into at some length, was that Rothbard uh, then had digressions in which he goes after some of the main Stream says one of the funniest ones being monopolist to competition, and how hilarious that is. In fact, I mean, I'd read about it. Paul Samuelson in his textbook uses the example of a barber shop. Joe's barber shop is, is, is all screwed up because it's a monop- monopolistically competitive. You know, it's competitive because it's a barber shop. It's monopoly because it's run by Joe. And and the, and and the non sequitur from that is that Joe's Barbershop is operating with excess capacity. I got I digress on that, but it's the funniest aspect of uh, of mainstream economics, which Rothbard helped me prick and showing that that it's all based on the geometry of how you, you draw your your average cost curves. And Rothbard actually showed that you could draw the curves in two other ways, and you could resolve this problem that that Samuelson thought exists under what do we what he liked to call monopolistic competition. There were other digressions in that book that made a difference to me. And so then uh, I uh, I was at that point, uh, I guess I was working for the, uh, well, oh, that's right. I dropped out of college. I was uh, dropped out of teaching and I went to Wall Street. I worked for the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, but I spent then the next several years uh, haunting the laissez-faire bookshop downtown. Uh, I lived uptown and uh, browsing and buying a couple of books. So I sort of read through all of the Austrian canon over several years. And then I got a job as, as a, a columnist with Barron's and did that for a quarter of a century. And of course, I had problems in different ways. I had to cover the numbers. And I guess part of what I contribute to an understanding of economics is that I do understand all of the official numbers, both government and private. 
because that's what I covered. Every once in a while, if you're writing in a column, not everybody realizes you're an Austrian because you have to cater to who's out there. But then when I became book review editor, I was able to bring in a number of Austrians to review books for me at Barron's. And, uh, and then oftentimes, of course, my column made it pretty clear that my orientation was in an Austrian direction. So I've had a pretty much of a joy ride. Uh, and I guess part of what I, the way I was able to, to think in terms of my role is that, look, I'm, I'm not exactly writing for the New York Times the way, amazingly, Henry Hazlitt wrote for the New York Times. Nobody, no, nobody at the New York Times would touch me, but at least I was working for a pretty much mainstream publication with a, with a half a million readers who were interested in the stock market, but their polls showed that about one-third of the readership read me. So that was like you know, nearly 100,000 people. So I thought, well, I'm bringing Austrians here. I'm writing from an Austrian tradition. I'm behind enemy lines a little bit, contributing my little portion to what goes on. And I left Barron's a couple of years ago, and now I've been having fun talking to people like Matt Kibbe. So when when did you find the the Soho Forum? When was the first? Oh, one? That, that was in the fall of 2016. Okay. And there, there I felt there was sort of a need. You know, there are debating societies that they're too much two against two. I should add, with respect to capitalism, that that part of what I was a little bit bothered by is that any time there was a debate about capitalism, and that was held by one particular debating society and some others, it was always putting capitalism on trial. It was basically, how good is capitalism? <laughs> and it was really capitalism compared. You bring up a couple of socialists on board, and they say, hey, you know, bosses are, you know, there are lots of mean bosses, and people have to work, and they're basically never asked to define socialism. You know, they're, they're always comparing capitalism with some kind of uh, vague notion of how we can all love each other and have a family uh, together. And never was capitalism compared with socialism. It was a criminal trial for capitalism, which, to, to, to quote Schumpeter, you know, it stands its trial before judges who have the sentence of death in their pockets. They're going to pass it, whatever defense they hear. The only success victorious defense can possibly hear, uh, achieve is a change in the indictment. So this is capitalism's hanging judges. So I knew it should be a custody trial. Who should have custody of the economy, socialists or capitalists? So force the socialists to define what they mean by socialism. What do they want? What, what, how do they envision the economy should be run? So that was part of the reason why I wanted to create my own debating society, so I could have legitimate debates about socialism versus capital, uh, capitalism versus socialism, rather than just putting capitalism on trial. And also make it one-on-one -on -one rather than the soundbite kind of thing that they did. Uh, uh, I, at many of the debating societies that I objected to. I had no experience raising money. I just happened to know Don Smith, who got turned on by my idea. Once I told him that I won't accept a salary, I'll do it for nothing. Uh, which so it would be a labor of love. It continues to be a labor of love. I get an office paid for it, but I, I don't take any, any salary to run it. And so it was lucky that I appeared before this group uh, this, uh, this, uh, of investors uh, who run uh, the Don Smith Family Foundation, and they were very skeptical that I could make a success of it. So I said, okay, why not, I, why not uh, finance the first four events? So our first four events we were selling out. Then we started, started to sell tickets and earn a good income come from that. And so it's been a very, uh, very, the most satisfying thing I've ever done. I can claim to be a social entrepreneur, finally, in my life, after being, having been a freelance writer a little bit, and then having been a salaried person for most of my career. Finally, I created something not quite as grandiose as what Matt Kibbe has done, but but something, something at least that contributes. And we stick to our last. I love interviews. I love lectures. I love all kinds of other events. Even panel discussions are sometimes okay. Uh, although I sometimes object to those, but uh, but uh, so we're just a one-on-one -on -one debating society. We stick to our knitting. Yeah. Don, Don yeah. Smith was a was a hero. Like he 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 was the guy that would always put his money where his mouth was. Oh, you knew Don? Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. Yeah. And and wrap up with this. You have a the first live Soho Forum coming yeah. up. Coming up. Coming up in uh, in in September. September. Knock down, drag out. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Fight to the death. Well, no, no character assassination is allowed at the Soho Forum. <laughs> and uh, 
I was just just words, please. Just words, but no assass no character assassination. It was I permitted it once when Walter Block called Nick Gillespie a vile human being, and that was only that was just funny, even though Walter didn't mean it to be funny. It was funny, and but we don't allow character assassination. September eighth, we're having a debate, uh, which where we, where we hopefully find a place on Bleecker Street, uh, the place to be announced. We're looking at a couple of places, and th there will be a party afterwards at our loft apartment. So that's an attraction. We have a loft apartment that can accommodate a little over 100 people. And so, uh, and uh, when when the Mises Caucus showed up, we had 180 people uh, in that loft apartment, and they somehow didn't mind rubbing against each other the way they did. And then we're having Scott Horton versus uh, Bill Crystal, October uh, 4th, and that is going to be at a big theater called Symphony Space at Upper Broadway. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to do a little, again, an interactive tomorrow morning here, just for those of you who are present. I, I look forward to doing an interactive on on uh, on on work and need employer greed, which is a phrase I got from uh, a, a good simple phrase from uh, George Reisman, uh, who had his moments explaining things simply, uh, and will try to explain how wages are determined, even with employer greed and worker need, but then get into some politically incorrect parts of it, including, of course, mentioning Hayek's part part of it, merit. So we are going back to New York for our soul forum, but we we've done two debates here up at the Pork Fest, and we certainly will do more in the future at Pork Fest. And I wanted to ask you about, you don't appear on Bill Maher anymore? What, what happened? You, uh, um, you No, not anymore. Have been but, but, I, mean, I, just, I just don't do that stuff anymore. Well, that was, yeah, that's, I mean, that, that's real sound bites. That's yeah. real, that's that's a little bit, you know. I, I, like, I like this format better. Exactly, and, yeah. Like, I would love to have yeah. a a thoughtful conversation with Bill Maher, because I think he's a really interesting guy. Okay, yeah. But but the show is sort of designed to be a shout fest. Yes, indeed. And there are there are limits to which you can accomplish doing that. Right. Yeah. No, and that, that of course is my emphasis with the soul form. If it's one on one, people are up there. They speak for fifteen minutes. There's a risk that they may be boring you. Absolutely. But I want to give every give them a chance to actually express their thoughts. And even fifteen minutes is sometimes a brief period. So that's indeed my uh, my stock and trade. And the sound bites. I mean, uh, what's his name? The most popular guy on Fox. It's all. I just, it's just painful to listen to sometimes. Yeah. It's a it's a ping pong game where you you get you get fired. I I used to appear because I, I I was at uh, Barons and of course we were part of Fox. We were part of Rupert Murdoch's empire and and I always knew I, I it, was, it was always a test. Ask me a question. I get two sentences out, am I going to be able to get a third sentence out? Very rarely. They'll interrupt you with the next question right. once you're on your third sentence. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So you guys have your reading assignment. Yeah. Rothbard, Hayek, <laughs> Soul. Man, economy. Uh, thank, Mirage give everybody of social justice and not in this okay. Thank you, sir. Sure. Okay. What is that? That's like long. That was amazing. Where can I get more content just like that? It's a great question. You're clearly a discerning consumer of the best content. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, and click the bell. And if you're consuming podcasts, go to Apple, Stitcher, anywhere you get them. I'm in. Kibbe on Liberty, honest conversations with interesting people.